going to finish up our series on ex nihilo, which means creating something out of nothing. It's a Latin word, which means something out of nothing. I had a great first service, and we're going to pray for people at the end of the service, people that want to do something with their lives and really go for the things of God. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. I want to read the scripture to you out of the amplified version of the Bible. He says this, We are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time. That we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. I believe God has a plan and a purpose for every single human being on earth. It's my job as a pastor to help you discover the destiny that God has planned for you. What does God have for you? And discover that destiny. We've been talking about this whole thing about the, in passing in review briefly, about that there's, uh, in Genesis chapter 1 and, and verse 1 and 2, there's a gap between verse 1 and verse 2. And somehow the earth we came form without form and void. Sometimes our lives take that path that's a wrong path down the road and God wants to bring it back we've asked people to share their vision just a little thought a little a little your vision should be a, just a very quick little sentence and then a plan should be a finely uh, calculated plan and we've asked you to write it down on the board over here many of you have and we've been praying over those visions and we'll keep that board up for a few more weeks as we're praying over those but there's something about creating something from nothing there's something about creating ex nihilo, which means out of nothing, and God can take nothings and make them somethings, and I believe I'm talking to a bunch of people that are going to do something great with their life. Whatever degree that means to you, I believe God has something great. But really, it depends on how we see what God sees. In Numbers chapter 13 and verse 26, read these scriptures before, but pass it in review as we finish this series up. It says, now they departed, and this is verse 26, and they're talking about the spies that went and spied out the land of Israel, which we know is the land of Israel today. They spied out the land, and they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and the congregation of the children of, of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us, and it truly flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who we dwell in the land are, are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jubazites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go against these people. For they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is the land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people we saw in the men of a great stature. And notice this statement. And there we saw the, the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. All this was perceived because we know that these people were afraid of them when we went through all that. And let me encourage you to get this series of lessons this these cds if you want to and get these and, and, and mull over them but god promised these children of Israel this he, he promised them he gave them a word he said i'm going to give you this land and how they saw themselves mattered to whether they fulfilled their destiny how you see yourself or how you see the vision and how you act on it will matter on how you fulfill the destiny that god has planned and purpose you are his workmanship created anew born anew. God predestined a good works for you. He pre predestined an amazing life for you. But we have to walk in that. Sometimes there's giants and how you see that and how you perceive that will make a difference in our lives. Today I want to talk to you about you can't live without vision. Proverbs 29, 18, you can't live with a without a word from God, a vision from God. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. The word perish there in the, in the Hebrew literally means to perish like fruit. You become stinky, rotten, and old. And I don't think any of us want to become stinky, rotten, and old. Amen? Are you, are you all awake out there? Everybody has to live by some kind of vision, some kind of goal, some kind of dream that they have in their life. The Apostle Paul lived by one. Peter lived by one. Abraham lived by one. Adam 
Uh, even Adam in the garden lived by one. Everyone who ever accomplished anything in the Bible lived by a word they got from God or a vision. I want to give you some thoughts today to wrap up the series. I want to give you why it's important to have a vision for your life. What is the what does it mean to have a vision? Now, your vision, you might say, well, 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 I don't know what my vision is. Well, y- your vision might be just to accomplish this resolution of being the best husband and father and, and friend that you can have. And the, but part of that resolution is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to support my church. I'm going to get involved in a church. And many times a church has a great vision for a city, and then you just get behind that vision. Many, some people have the, those things outside of that, but most people would just get behind the vision of a local ministry or so on and so forth. And really, I think that's really should be the goal of all of us is to get behind. I would make a great church member. I'd, make, I'd be a great church member if I was just a member. I'd make a great church member because I'd just get in there and I'd work to the bone to fulfill the vision of a local church. And, man, we have a great vision here at Faith Center Church. We're reaching our generation with a message of victory. We're building strong families, equipping people for successful living, and reaching out to a world that certainly needs Jesus. We have a lot to do here, people, and I need you to fulfill your destiny so that we can accomplish it. Amen? All right, let's talk about five different things that vision causes in our life. Number one, it will cause you to develop whatever skills necessary to fulfill it. See, I was never called to go to Bible school. I was called to go to ministry, so I had to go to Bible school. It made me develop skills. You may not be called to go to college, but you're called to a profession, and so you have to have the college to be to do a profession. You may not call, be called to have a baby, but you might be called to be a great mother or dad, so it'll change you. Your skills will have to improve to accomplish those goals. So... When I went to Bible school back in 1979, I gave up everything that I own, everything that I have to go to Bible school. I'm so glad I made that choice back then, but it was, a, it was not an easy choice because of the money I was making. You've heard the story. Uh, it was not an easy choice, but we did it, and we're so thankful that we did it. And it caused me to grow. It caused me to do something in my life that I wouldn't normally have done. So number one, vision will cause you to change. It will cause you to grow. It will cause you to do something with your life that maybe you, you wouldn't do. Number two. It will cause the development of your faith. In Genesis chapter 12, we, have the, we look at Abram or Abraham. He became Abraham, but his name was Abram. And I love this, this part where Abram's calling, or God is calling Abram out of his place. And he says in chapter 12, verse 1, he says, he says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country and from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. And make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. And and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And I love this next verse, because God gives a word to Abram, and he says, I want you to get out from your family, your countrymen. I want you to go out on your own, because I, I guess from what... The tradition tells us, the Bible doesn't say this, but tradition tells us, and maybe some historical other books tell us, that Abraham was a, come from a group of sun worshipers, and they were a pagan group of people, and God said, I'm going to, I'm going to, I picked you to go out from amongst them. Now, most people in our little Bible stories picture Abraham when he goes out and he, you know, he's doing his little tent thing and all this kind of stuff as being about a 35-year-old guy. But let's find out how old he was. Let's read on. It says, so Abraham departed, and I love that part, so Abraham departed. As soon as God spoke to him, so Abraham departed, and the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. 75 years old. I think that's amazing, because we, and we're going to talk about excuses down the road here, but 75 years old is not young. And, I mean, this guy, he said, God says, I'm going to give you, I'm going to, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And this was happened like 25 years later. And, and he says, I want you to get out. He said, I want you to go do this thing. I'm going to make you father of many nations. And it is amazing to me, in our society today, 75 years is old. I mean, as a whole, 75 years is old. When you look at 75-year-old people, it seems like that we've kind of got, we've kind of talked ourselves into dying already. Or it's like we're, we, we think we're at the end of our life. But the reality is the Bible promises you, if you want to live to be 120 years, I believe there's a scriptural basis to live 120 years. Not many people do it t- nowadays, but I believe there's a scriptural basis to do it. I have a friend of mine who's just turned 70, 
And a bunch of his friends got together, including myself, and we bought him a new, uh, not a new one, but a used sports car, a little convertible sports car. And he's 70 years old, and he's pastor in a great church in San Antonio. Some of you know him. His name is Rick Godwin. And he's been to our church before and spoke. And this guy's running around in a sports car, blowing rock and roll music, pastors a church, 5,000 people, and he acts like he's 35 years old. I don't want, when I get to be 75, I don't want to be old. I, I may be old in age, but I don't, I don't think we have to get old in the sense of with our attitudes and our thought processes. I think we should stay fired up. I mean, I don't want to get to the place where, you know, I got to, you know, take this pill at, you know, at 11.52, I got to take this pill. And, and if I do have to take the pill, and I, I'm nothing wrong with taking pills, but if I have to take the pill at 11.52 every day, it's going to be in, on my Harley driving down the roads, trying to swallow some rain or something, do something. I think you got to keep going. You got to do something with your life and not get old. Would you agree with that? Let your body get old, but don't let your spirit get old. Stay fired up. Get around these young people. You know, some of you, you know, we get a little older, and we don't like the music that happens here at the church sometimes. I think it should be, it's kind of like, you know, 75-year-old having a kid, kind of like, I got to live for something, man. Get in, get it, just enjoy that music. Get involved in that stuff, because I think it'll make you young in your life. Let's just don't get old. Abram just got started in his ministry at 75 years old. Well, this is a Bible character, you know. Well, I mean, I'm telling you, the Bible promises us 120 years of life if you want to live that long. I just want to be, just 87 is all I want to live. But I, when I go out at 87, I'm going to go out with a bang. I'm probably going to play golf that morning, ride my Harley, and then die. I don't know what I'm going to do. But it, it's going to be a fun day. I'm, I'm looking forward to that day. You all laugh, but it's going to happen. If you can live by faith, you can die by faith. Amen? Amen? Faith is acting on what you believe. Step out, not knowing the future. There's something about creating something from nothing. God loves it when we step out and we do something. There's something about... If you're going to be involved with God, he's going to require this thing called faith. And faith is not always fun or easy. And we get sometimes locked into our ways. I remember a couple that came to our Bible school. And um, they're, both, they're both passed away now because it was, but they were probably pushing 60, you know, 60 years old when they came to our Bible school, the Bible school I went to back in 1979. Clinton and Sarah Utterback, and they both worked for the post office, and they had all this retirement. You know, they were going to retire, and they are going to have all these things, and da-da-da. And the Lord said, I want you to give everything up and go to Bible school. And everybody freaked out, said, you're giving up all this stuff? You're giving up all this stuff? And they came to Bible school one year, and they went out, and they built one of the greatest churches that the East Coast has ever seen. They're passed away now because it's 30-some years ago. But they, they came out, and they built one of the greatest churches. They left the security of things. You just have to go because God says, don't just go to go. But when God speaks to you, you got to have some faith and go. Amen? It'll develop your faith. There's something about that stepping out. Number three, without vision, we have a lot of excuses in our lives. S excuses prevail when we, when we don't have vision in our lives. Let me read a scripture to you. This is not on... You have to catch the scripture if you guys can follow me on this. It was 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. I, I uh, found it in between services. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mining God to pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, or one translation says, casting down reasonings, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought captivity to the obedience of Christ. Here's some of the excuses we use. Those, those reasonings start getting a hold of us. The reason why we can't do things. Number one, I'm too old. Again, I'm too old. Abraham was 75. Caleb was 80. Caleb was 80 years old when he finally entered the promised land. Those two spies that went out, Caleb and Joshua were the two spies, and they got to enter the promised land. And when he got to that promised land, he looked at a mountain. He says, give me this mountain. He, he, was, he said, I'm just as spry and, and can, he said I'm just as strong as I was when I was 40 now he probably wasn't but he sure acted like it and he was 80 years old before he got to go so I think being old is not an excuse how about this one I'm damaged too many divorces too many um, past sins um, too many this too many that and I'm telling you God had a prostitute on his ministry team. The dude had a prostitute on his ministry team. Mary was a prostitute. We don't think she was active, but he had a prostitute on his ministry team. If he had a prostitute on his ministry team, what excuse do you have? You are not damaged goods in the eyes of God. It's kind of like this, you know, I, I've used this example before, but 
I, if I took out this $20 bill, and I'm not going to give it away today like I normally do, but if I, if I took out this, nor, this $20 bill, and, and I took this 20 and I, and I just crinkled it all up, and I made a mess out of it, how many of you, how many of you, now how many of you want that $20 bill? Well, wait a minute, it's damaged. It's damaged. Well, so, so what if I, what if I tear it? I'm not going to tear it very much because what if I, what, what if I ripped it in half? You, how many of you still want that if I ripped it in half? Well, why? It's damaged. You don't want it if it's damaged. It, it still has value is right. It still has value because God places value on the person, not on what's happened to that person. Our value is not based upon what's happened to a person or what they've gone through. Our value is based upon the what God is willing to pay. God is willing to pay his son for you. So you, if you're damaged goods, you have no excuse. We're not going to let you have an excuse. It doesn't matter abortions. It doesn't matter um, uh, marriages. It doesn't matter prostitution. And, and we, we know people that right here in our church that were involved in prostitution and different things and and all those kind of stuff. And they're amazing, amazing people today. I would put up them, some of those people, up against anybody in our church. And just amazing, amazing people. You have no excuses. You're not damaged goods. Amen? How about this one? Well, I'm, I'm just not smart enough. I, I, I'm just not smart enough. I, I can't do it. You know, when I graduated from high school, and I like to say I graduated from high school, gradu- and, and I got myself an education from Battleground, um, I wasn't the smartest. You know, per, I didn't like to read. I, I, I think I, I don't know. They probably would have died. They probably would have gave me some kind of Ritalin or something when I, now. But I think I need it even now because it's even worse. But, but I didn't. I didn't like to read. I, I, I just couldn't read, and I was not a good reader. I'm the kind of reader that, that I have to read something. You know, you know how you read a page, and next thing you know, you're, you're drifting somewhere, and you're like somewhere else. You know, and that's the way I, I, I was just like that. I. I couldn't read. I, I just, I, I mean, reading just makes my stomach churn. And like to sit down and my wife will say, I just want to sit down with a good book. I think that's a, that's a torture worse than death for me. <laughs> I mean, it just, I mean, I just, I'll just lay by the pool and read a good book. I'm like, I, I'll lay by the pool, but I got to be doing something. I mean, I might read a, something. That, I got 15, and I'm reading 15 books at a, at a time, and they're all over the house. And I read this chapter and that chapter because they bore me after a bit, and I just, you know, and then they get redundant and everything else. And you know what? When you have ADD, you'll find out uh, that um, that most people set out to write a book to say, I'm going to write a 200-page book. And when they reach 125 pages, they have nothing to say. And so the rest of it is just a bunch of junk anyway. So I just read to the 125th page, and then I'm done with the thing. And you learn that when you have ADD. But, but the reality is, it, now, now think about this now. I'm talking about not being smart enough. When I graduated from high school, I'd read one book from cover to cover. And it certainly wasn't a high school textbook. I read one book. It was the Green Bay Diary of Jerry Kramer. And I read it from, it was a sports book, and I read it cover to cover, actually a couple times because I enjoyed the book. And it took me a long time to do it. But, I, but now, because of the position that I hold, I consider myself to be an educated, highly educated person because of all the books that I've had to read over the years. Because I have forced myself and made myself educate myself because I knew to keep up with you people, I have to educate myself. You're not going to put up with a guy that's not educating himself. So I've had to educate myself. So this vision has caused me to be an educated person. The vision drives me into reading a book a week, on, or either on tape or something. I have to be reading constantly, and I'm a voracious reader, and I still hate to read, but I buy books all the time, and I read them because I have to, because the vision is stronger than my, my, my inability to read. Does that make sense? And then about this education thing, you got to be careful with that, because someone said this. I love this proverb. They told the, us college professor, they said, um, they said uh, to a college professor one time, they said, now be careful with your A and B students. He says, treat them very good because they'll come back and they will be college professors alongside of you. But he said, be very careful with your C, D, and F students because they'll come back and build a wing onto the college. And I think that goes for me right there. Is I think the drive of your life is what keeps you going. So education is not... Your education to, to proceed in your ex knee elio, to create something out of nothing, cannot be an excuse for you. You just have to go and then make that up later. How about this? I'm too young. 
David killed Goliath at 17 years old and really became king at a young age. You can't make excuses if you're going to accomplish the will of God for your life. You cannot make excuses. You have to just set out and go for it. I'm not too old. I'm not too fat. I'm not too skinny. I'm not too thin. I'm not too dumb. I'm not too anything. If God tells you to do it, then all that stuff will come because your vision has to be stronger than everything else. Did you get this? Number four, vision will motivate you to change. Proverbs 6.23 says this, For the commandment is a lamp and a law... A, a light reproofs of instruction are the way of life we need to embrace challenges we need to embrace people that confront us we need to embrace growth and change let me give you give uh, let me get, get an example here uh, somebody tim come up here real quick jump up here real quick so tim and i want to show you an example about growth and change see everybody wants growth but nobody wants change. Lock arms with me like this. All right. So I'm growth. He's change. You cannot have growth without change. So if I'm growth, I pull change along with me, and it has to come. It has to come with me. You cannot have, you cannot have one without the other. Growth and change are simultaneous. If you're not going to change, you're never going to have growth. Growth and change are together. You have to, they come along with you. You have to have them. Thanks, Tim. You have to have them together. Growth and change come together. So change is a way of life. You might have to change friends. You might have to change uh, some relationships in your life. You might have to change your television habits. You might have to change something in your life to cause you to create this thing that God wants you to create. But if you, if you don't get started, it's not going to happen. Number five, and finally, and then we're going to pray for some people, is vision motivates you and moves you and motivates you. It'll, it'll cause you to be in a prayer room at 6 a.m. in the morning. It'll cause you to study. It'll cause you to save money. For me, vision motivates me so much I don't have time for sickness. I, don't, I just don't have time for it. I don't make room for it. I don't claim it. I just don't have time for it because I'm, I'm too busy building a church. I don't have time for poverty. I have to, we have to have millions of dollars to do what we're doing. I don't have time for it. People, you yeah, preach prosperity. Well, what else are we going to preach? We got a, we got a, we got a, we got a world to win, brothers and sisters. We got a world to win. I'm telling you, there's something about it. I don't have time for poverty. I don't have time for divorce. I don't have time for it. I, I can't get divorced. My wife, you all kick me out of here. I don't have, there goes my ex Nelio. I'm going to be ex in, in, a, in an apartment somewhere is what I'm going to be. So I don't have time. I don't have time. I have to be motivated. Do I enjoy getting up in the morning and, and making my coffee and coming down here and praying? No, but I have to because it's part of the job. It's part of who I am. It's part of what I do. It's, it's part of the results. Now, can I get away with not for a while? I can come up with some cool messages, and I could come up with some cool stuff, and I could fool a few people a little while. But if you don't get up and do the thing, man, it's like, it's kind of like, you know, you walk in and it's kind of like lifting weights. You can tell somebody, yeah, I get to the gym five days a week. But after three or four months, we're going to all say, you don't look like you go to the gym four or five days a week. And I think that's the way you, t you treat me as your pastor. Yeah, I pray, I pray 18 hours a day. The congregation going to say, well, you don't get many results for that. So we can talk and brag all we want, but what really motivates? What's, what's it that drives you up in the more? What gets you up and gets you thinking and gets you motivated in the things of God? I tell you, if you don't have that in your life, I'm not sure we're ever going we're, we're to perish. Well, I just want the job, and I want to retire, and I want that. Well, okay, that's fine. Okay, that's cool and all that stuff, but don't you have something that, don't you have something in your life that's a passion that you get up every day thinking about accomplishing, doing something in your life that you just, it's just your, 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 your passion to do something? I think if we don't have that, guys, I'm not sure what we have.